thought he was gone. <laughs> Okay, so let's go ahead and we're start back up. We have what's going to prove to be a fantastic panel on privacy. We are just, just to let everybody know there, we are actually videotaping this panel, which I found kind of funny myself, but so we're videotaping the panel on privacy. And um, we have a shake weight on the stage, that's awesome. All right, I'm going to pass this off. Gall, turn it over to you as the moderator. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today at the Energy Sex Summit. And if you're here to discuss uh, privacy in the red room, the other room is the all my access. So everybody here in the red room, all right, closing the cabin doors, <laughs> taking off. Cool. So thanks for coming. Uh, just before we formally start, I wanted to maybe ask the audience a little bit about why you're here and maybe your background and interest. Uh, how many here are here to look at legal issues and civil rights issues? privacy versus more business and uh, compliance and stuff. Nobody's here to learn anything. So free drink. <laughs> you learn. How many people here are fairly technical? Okay. Versus maybe less technical and more on the legal compliance side of things. Okay, cool. Just trying to get some guidance for the, the panelists so that we won't stray too deep or not deep enough. It seems like there's a little bit of a good mix for everybody. Is there anybody here on the regular regulator side, law enforcement side, <coughs> utility side, activist side? No particular leaning. Okay. Oh, we cool. got one from Texas over here. Got one from Texas. Two from Regular. Texas. Regular. One on table. Texas, one regulator. Texas one non-regulator. So I'll let the panelists introduce themselves a little bit. Uh, we have, after a brief introduction, so we have uh, Chris Shepard from ISCCP, uh, Sarah Cortez, who is an uh, independent uh, researcher uh, and consultant. Uh, we actually met back in 2009 when we started the NIST uh, privacy subgroup of uh, NIST for 7628. We'll write a chapter together with uh, Rebecca Harrell and Chris Deltos, and since then it's ballooned into uh, a lot of lawyers and other uh, private professionals, and that's when I ditched it. Uh, and we have uh, Chris uh, Villarreal again, from uh, California POC, and we have uh, Lee Ken from EFF. Electronic, uh, so if you could each tell us a little bit about yourself and what your background is in terms of uh, current research interests and what brought you into the, the privacy space and specifically maybe about why you're interested in smart grid and privacy. <laughs> All right, so I'll start off. Is this on? No. Um, is it on now? Is it? No. no I think it's on, but it's fine. It's got warm up. Better? Yep. Better? Yes. All right, so I'll be the first to say that uh, for the first couple of minutes of these things, I am nervous. So I have crib notes for two reasons. One, so I don't forget anything. Second, so I don't talk too long. So once I go finish my notes and this whole thing, I'll stop talking. <laughs> But I uh, actually came out of the banking industry about 16 years there, so there's a lot of regulation around uh, the privacy issues, uh, a lot of uh, project management from IT perspective, uh, Y2K as we all remember. Came into the electric utility industry just <coughs> before 9-11, uh, and uh, actually at a uh, regional uh, power company, the first day was uh, September 12th, the IT project kind of escalated from there. So uh, my company deals with a lot of critical infrastructure uh, information. Uh, we do lots of compliance, and we have to, by nature, keep our clients' information confidential. Along with that, on the consumer side, we've got residential and then also business client-related concerns for privacy. So as far as the smart grid concerns, um, I definitely have uh, my opinions, which I'll share uh, after we go through the rest of the panel here. But um, I, I think the smart grid is necessary, and I think privacy concerns are real. And I think that will have a lot of good dialogue here today. I hope so. Hi, <coughs> I'm Sarah Cortez. And uh, as Gal mentioned, he and I uh, have been collaborating for a while at NIST on the um, cybersecurity working group to the smart grid. But um, energy matters are something that I know the least about. I'm first to admit I'm an information security professional 
And uh, so I'm always learning from my colleagues about energy. <coughs> um, I'm also currently a PhD student uh, getting my um, doctorate in uh, computer information systems as well, studying cybersecurity and anonymizers and various other topics. Um, and I'm mainly an information security professional with a consulting practice to Fortune 500 companies. <coughs> I was formerly senior vice president and executive at uh, Putnam Investments, a uh, large asset management company that sells subsidiary of Marshall McLennan. When um, during 9/11, when uh, the planes went into our data center at the World Trade Center, um, and we failed over on that day um, through Boston. So I also have a background in disaster recovery as well as security, and um, that's kind of how I got involved. Right now, I'm collaborating with a number of my colleagues as well, currently in rewriting the Smart Grid um, cybersecurity uh, working document on legal and regulatory issues with respect to the Smart Grid, which is the topic of our panel today. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Villarreal, the California PUC. Um, my first opening statement is that all opinions are my own and not those of the commission, yeah. Mr. Camera. Um, <laughs> so I got involved in the Smart Grid approximately December 2008 as that was the opening of the commission's order investigating, order instituting rulemaking on developing policies for the Smart Grid in the state of California. Um, as that proceeding has progressed since 2008, one of the things that we um, ended up addressing, both on our own motion and at the direction of the California legislature, was developing rules related to the protection of customer privacy for data generated from advanced meters. And um, we started that in February 2010. And since then, I've been uh, working a lot on privacy as well as cybersecurity issues including the Sarah Noted, um, helping out on the rewrite of the uh, privacy chapter of the NIST IR. So I'm Lee Tan, I'm an attorney with a group called the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I suspect that no one in this room has heard of the, uh, the is anybody? Okay, we got it, no, that's not bad. Uh, anyway, we are a, a general sort of purpose, sort of high tech civil liberties activist law firm. Um, we sue people. We sued AT&T over the warrantless wiretapping case. We sued the NSA over it as well. Um, but, you know, for myself, I'm generally a free speech and privacy uh, person. My expertise in privacy ranges from uh, health records privacy to telecommunications, foreign intelligence surveillance, biometrics, uh, location privacy, uh, a whole range of uh, different high-tech privacy issues. And probably, you know, years ago, uh, we at EFF became aware that uh, there were real issues with electrical with electrical usage or power consumption and privacy, uh, because <coughs> it had been shown long ago that if you really did have a good look at um, appliance load signatures, you could know things about what people were doing from the inside. But we didn't have smart meters back then. Uh, so it was sort of a, a theoretical possibility unless someone was focused on the actual home in question. Uh, what the smart grid and smart meters do is essentially put that architecture or infrastructure of potential sort of surveillance into routine use. And depending on how you know granular uh, what the interval data on, on this, um, we think there are serious you know, privacy issues. So uh, since 2008, 2009, it's something that we've been much more focused on. We submitted a lot of comments to the government. Uh, we participated in the uh, NISTER, uh, and we worked pretty hard in the PUC uh, with uh, another civil liberties group, Center for Democracy and Technology, and sort of ironically enough, PG&E uh, being honking utility to sort of cooperate and put together uh, sort of a consensus set of privacy rules and practices, which she, uh, the commission actually liked quite a lot and ended up being sort of the basis for uh, the decision uh, a year or two ago. Thanks. Uh, Chris, if you have the mic, uh, could you describe uh, a little bit about how the commission arrived at <coughs> where we are today in terms of what <coughs> the, the state, how the state approaches these uh, potentially 
marketable third, to third party entities and certainly subpoenable by law enforcement. So all this uh, meter, uh, and obviously we're focusing on smart meter today because uh, that's where the nexus, uh, the, the biggest nexus of privacy is for the consumer at least, as opposed to uh, more intellectual property of uh, how uh, to resell various uh, load data, things like that on the market. But uh, we're, we're focusing today mostly on the, the advanced metering infrastructure and the kind of things you can glean about that, uh, about the, the consumer in terms of uh, patterns of uh, wake and sleep, what kind of appliances they use, things like that. And theoretically, the benefit of all this advanced metering is I think uh, you can expound upon more than I can is that there is this great demand uh, uh, load uh, response capability that is enabled by the smart meter. And so you can sign up to get some energy savings and reduce uh, some of your costs as a consumer and the benefit to the overall strategic uh, grid space, if you will, is that the grid can uh, be more agile and, and, and have a little bit better uh, planning in, in, uh, in terms of policies and the thresholds and in real time start actively shutting off certain appliances or encouraging people to uh, create uh, better habits so they can save money. So if, uh, if, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about how the state, when California is usually a bellwether for other states uh, that, that look to California as uh, some people would say progressive, not in a political sense left or right, but in terms of uh, being first. So can you tell us a little bit about how the, the state arrived at its current perspective on what AMI looks like, feels like, and can you sell it? <coughs> Who does it belong to? Things like that. Sure. Um, so beginning in 2006, the commission began approving uh, funding for AMI investment by the three major electric utilities, investor-owned electric utilities in California. Um, the basic architecture of that AMI is hourly granular, hourly collection of data, transmitted three to four times a day back to the utility. The data is then uploaded, validated by the utility, and put on a web page for all customers in the service territories to look at the next day. So I can go onto my account on pge.com, pge.com, and look at my last day's usage on an hourly basis. Um, that was done primarily for a number of benefits on the utility side to do more energy efficiency, enable more demand response, as well as provide customers with that level of information to help them manage their own consumption better. Uh, eventually when we roll it out and we pair it with the more dynamic pricing tariffs, then the customers will be able to understand how their usage impacts both their bills as well as the impacts on the state generally. So as we progressed and AMI came closer and closer to completion, um, a number of, of issues came up related to to privacy of that data and how do we make use of that data for many of the purposes that California wants to wants to enact. And um, while we were about to kick off that initiative in a regulatory process, the legislature passed a bill called SB 1476, which put the framework around the requirements that a utility must meet in order to maintain the privacy of customer information. Um, it created a framework that's uh, primary purpose and secondary purpose. Uh, primary purpose means that the utility and a third party does not need to get customer consent. Um, generally speaking, these are for basic utility operations, planning, procurement, settlements, you know, things that normally take, on, take place under utility control. Um, second uh, exemption was if it's done for the, if it's done with ex express consent or requirement of a state law, a federal law, or a commission direction. And the third one is, the, is uh, probably the more um, open-ended one. It's to implement and plan energy efficiency, demand response, or energy management um, programs. All those must be utility programs. So if you're a third party and you're a contractor with utility and you're doing one of those three things, you don't need customer consent, but you must keep the uh, data private and confidential pursuant to the contract with the utility. Um, so with that basic framework, the commission expanded upon, upon that in our rules, which we issued in July 2011, and we expanded on it by allowing the customers more authority on sharing the data that they want to with a third party that, that they want to share it with. And um, as the rules developed, um, we kept that basic framework of primary purpose and secondary purpose. Anything that's not primary purpose is a secondary purpose and requires customer consent. Um, so as the rules apply to utilities, utility contractors, and third parties that obtain the data from the utility. 
So what we're thinking about is more of those green button implementations or the green button connect my data implementations where a third party with customer consent directly connects to the utility uh, networks to download the data directly. If the third party is getting the data directly from the customer, our rules do not apply. Uh, the general viewpoint is that the customer is in control of who actually they want to share the data with, and if they want to give their data away, they're free to do it at this time. And a lot of these rules, as Lee pointed out, um, were done with the help of Lee, CDT, as well as PG&E. There was actually a real interest by PG&E to get some rules in place for privacy as well as customer access of data. And as the process, as the proceeding progressed, they, those three entities pretty much led the effort to develop the rules. And um, the end result of it, I think, are a pretty good set of rules based on uh, fair information practice principles um, that um, are pretty good that I think other entities could rely on and, and base their own privacy rules on. Thank you. Uh, Chris, do you think that you can maybe uh, draw from that and discuss from the utility side? You do a lot of consulting to utilities. Have you seen parallels to that where the utilities are proactive and take that in mind and want to cooperate uh, with uh, the PUCs and the various states in order to proactively stay out of trouble and say, you know, everybody agrees that these are the best practices, and so if someone comes after us, we can say we, we work with the best civil liberties folks with the, with the, you know, the people uh, that are on the ground consuming the electricity. So I'm going to answer that in kind of a roundabout session, a roundabout way. There's a nine different states now that have similar environmental. Well, they have some kind of law. Okay. <clears throat> so I think utilities are very interested in this mainly because the smart grid is necessary. I'm going to just step back a second. Uh, just to level set that everybody in the room here, I'm going with the assumption that we all agree that a, a reworking of the existing grid is necessary. Smart grid, by definition, is kind of a two-way communications between uh, two different intelligent devices, whether starting at the generation plant through the transmission distribution to your house, consumers, whether it's residential or business. It's important for a couple of different reasons. One is uh, the grid is old. It needs to be uh, rebuilt, and it's going to cost a lot of money to try and rebuild the infrastructure we currently, currently have. It makes uh, it's much smarter, more, much more economically feasible over the long term if we have a grid which is self-healing, load balancing, that will draw um, power resources from a more local geographical <coughs> source versus trying to get over transmission lines where there, there's loss and things like that. So my question starting out is, would everybody in the room basically agree that a smart grid implementation is a good idea. Did anybody not think that way? Okay. And then I don't need to go backwards. I don't need, don't need to talk too much about um, customer education benefits and things like that. Uh, utilities definitely have a benefit to be working with the PUCs. They definitely have. Uh, it's in their favor because consumer education is critically important. If the consumers understand what they're getting for the effort, it is easier to explain why the data is needed. Data is already going to utilities specifically for billing and, and such. It's not that uh, personal private information isn't being transferred or isn't available or isn't being stored. But with the smart meter situation, um, as uh, Lee was pointing out, there are additional factors, additional data points which are being transmitted, which are of some concern depending on how that data is used. So to answer your question, um, utilities are embracing it, but I think there's more to be done on the utility side relative to consumer education and making sure that consumers get buy-in. Because without consumer buy-in, it's going to be very, very tough for uh, the smart grid to move at a pace it needs to move before we start handling other issues. Brings us to uh, the, the issue of resistance to <coughs> smart grid, which usually comes in the form of resistance to smart meters. And that's why I'm wearing the uh, tinfoil hat and the special <laughs> medallion to shield me from the radiation that's coming from the smart meter, which is typically more of a health and safety concern, although there is a somewhat a kind of sideline to privacy. Uh, and I, I, I mock a little bit, if that's okay. Uh, but today we're talking about real privacy. I thought I'd be just a little bit, you know, it's almost Halloween. And it's a very kind of difficult topic, but I thought I'd be a little bit silly. But in terms of resistance to the grid, we see people um, that are, 
some people that are very uh, litigious and activist about resisting smart meter, especially in some states more than others. And uh, if there's any particular horror stories that you can think of, uh, maybe at least you could uh, tell us a bit more about from the legal side. I know there was a, a main uh, Supreme Court case that came out recently uh, that upheld the idea that uh, the smart metering can be opted out by the owner of the house through some sort of private property issues, not exactly the privacy directly, but the, the lawyers found a way to allow the consumer to opt out of a private, of a meter install. Can you describe that case a little bit? I'm actually going to hand this one to Sarah. Oh, Sarah is good. more familiar <laughs> with the Friedman case than I am. Sarah is not a lawyer, but she should be. <laughs> That's highly questionable as well. Now, I just want to say before I start that we're very glad that you're only mocking and being a little bit silly today at this panel. Usually I'm a lot more. help us. Uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> thanks. At least and Gal are talking about the Friedman case, which a number of you may be familiar with. Um, it's just recently been decided and uh, is very pertinent to smart meters and the smart grid. So if you walk away with anything today, Hopefully it will be a little bit of knowledge of three legal cases that are so important with respect to understanding the general uh, legal and regulatory framework that um, can apply to smart grid technology. And those are the Kelo case, decided by the um, United States Supreme Court, with which you may be familiar. The Golden Valley case, that I hope that Lee will talk about in more detail in a few minutes, and um, uh, Maine uh, PUC that was recently decided. So in the Maine case, um, it, uh, there was a series of legal decisions. Essentially, a number of citizens groups were resisting in New England, and I'm from New England myself, so we do not have smart meters there due to the extreme amount of um, litigation against bringing meters in for various reasons. And the groups that are against bringing in smart meters uh, suffered a number of legal setbacks that eventually resulted in them being ruled against on virtually every issue. They raised issues um, that smart meters did not adequately safeguard health and safety. They raised issues that smart meters and smart grid technology um, posed a threat to privacy. Um, they uh, raised a whole, a whole host of issues, all of which were ruled against them in the courts until they went to the Maine Supreme Court in a decision, I think, uh, dated August 1st of this year, very, very recent. And the Maine Supreme Court affirmed in part and denied in part. And this decision has been widely reported in the press and I'm very interested to read the press um, framing of this decision because it's almost universally been framed as a complete um, defeat of the consumer groups that are opposing smart meters. But if you read the case, it, it's actually not. It affirmed in part and denied in part. And uh, the main Supreme Court said that the regulators had not demonstrated the health and safety of smart meters. So they ruled against um, the utilities and said that uh, they, they were not allowed to um, force people to pay a high fee in order to opt out of smart meters, um, that they had not demonstrated their constitutional right to install smart meters based on health and safety concerns. However, with respect to privacy concerns, the court ruled that um, the utilities had met their burden of proof for proving that privacy was safeguarded for smart meters. So that was essentially the decision. Um, the, the only other comment I'll make on that case that's interesting, I think, is that the, the Supreme Court basically said that the reason um, Maine PUC had failed to make a winning argument about the health and safety of smart meters is because they had not bothered to make any argument about the health and safety of smart meters. They had not bothered to present any evidence demonstrating the health and safety or refuting that there was any um, threat to health and safety. So in a way, the court was sort of saying that if regulators had, or utilities had presented any uh, information or defense about health and safety, they might have ruled in their favor. On the other hand, they ruled that the utilities had proven that privacy was adequately safeguarded, which is actually a highly controversial point among people that are involved in that uh, very deeply. Um, but what's interesting is that the regulators also had not provided any testimony regarding the privacy safeguards. Nevertheless, the judge found in their favor. So it was a bit of an odd decision, and a number of us were discussing this before, and we actually were very curious to read the briefs um, on either side of that to and understand what we said. But we haven't, so. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to Lee, and maybe you can talk about the Golden Valley case. Yeah, I'll talk. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, you know, the relevance of, case, of a case like um, Kilo versus the United States, this is a case that the Supreme Court decided several years ago that found that uh, the police need a warrant, search warrant based on probable cause to use thermal imagery uh, imaging device to capture emanations from a home. And the principal reason that a that the, that the court said you needed to do this, even though the government argued that it was waste heat uh, and so sort of like garbage on the street and abandoned, was that it could. They actually made that argument. Yeah, um, <laughs> that because it was very clear that the reason the government was doing it was so that it could learn information about what was going on inside the home. Uh, and Justice Scalia, uh, who was not exactly the world's biggest privacy advocate, you know, pronounced very clearly that in the home all activities are intimate. Um, and you know, we have this normal sort of notion under the Fourth Amendment that you've got to protect the privacy of activities inside the home. So obviously this has implications for the park width because for what smart meter data of sufficient grand interval granularity uh, and with the right kinds of libraries of, of uh, load signatures, et cetera, will tell you is what's going on inside the home. Presence, uh, schedules, um, use of appliances, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in fact, in the Kilo case, uh, it's sort of ironic that the reason why they decided to target this particular home for uh, thermal imaging was because they had already gained by subpoena the uh, energy usage records, and so that they knew that these people met a profile uh, for a marijuana growing operation. So Kilo is sort of the, one of the cases that we, as privacy advocates, always point out as, look, this is why this is actually an important privacy issue, um, and that there's actually case law that uh, supports the idea that there have got to be limits on uh, government access to that kind of data. Now, the other side of this, of course, is that it's one thing when you sort of peer directly into the home, uh, and then it's another thing when you have access to data that someone else has already collected that could yield the same information, or sort of <coughs> two different paths to the same end. But the big difference is instead of like searching their home, or instead of tracking someone directly, um, you go to their cell carrier and you get a year's worth of their cell site location information, and then you can figure out, you know, where their cell phone has gone for a year. Uh, I think most people wouldn't really consider that there is an important difference between those two situations. In both cases, you are learning something about that person that's really pretty private. Uh, but the law has this kind of funny business record to third party record rule, uh, which is currently in a, a great deal of flux because people are starting to, to realize that like, gee, if you apply that to email, that means the difference between email that's point to point, email that's stored at, at Google or any kind of intermediate server, the, the, there's a big sort of privacy gap uh, just because it went through an intermediary. So in the Golden Valley case, the, uh, the DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration, came after um, an electrical cooperative in, based in Alaska. And this was, a lot of the co-ops, it seems, have actually wanted to protect their um, customers' privacy more than, I think, the standard large <laughs> uh, view. Uh, and so this, uh, this co-op, Golden Valley, actually contested the DEA subpoena. Uh, the DEA has a statute that allows them to, to send and to request this kind of data via an administrative subpoena. And that means it doesn't have to go to a judge for and so they fought this and they lost, but the ninth, in the Ninth Circuit just about a month or so ago. Uh, but the, the, there is a really interesting part of the Golden Valley decision where the Ninth Circuit panel says, but you know, we're not saying that if Golden Valley hadn't put in its terms of service with its customers, if, if it had said stronger things and done better things to protect the privacy of its customers and sort of act in a consistent way, then maybe a subpoena would not be enough. Maybe the Constitution and the Fourth Amendment would actually have required a warrant. Uh, and so that's a really interesting and I think very novel 
uh, sort of holding to come out of any case with regard to energy usage records. And so for, if you are um, an entity that is serving customers and you want to actually try to strengthen your privacy case uh, in terms of resisting uh, subpoenas, then Golden Valley sort of suggests that there's a way to do that by making really strong provisions in your terms of service. Now, right now in California, um, we have had a tariff for a number of years uh, that applies to uh, companies like PG&E, where it's not sufficient under the California Constitution and under the PUC law for a mere subpoena without some sort of judicial uh, involvement to uh, allow access to uh, subscriber records. Um, and I, I'll just throw this over to Chris in case he wants to comment on that. So the, the rules that the commission approved, um, should a subpoena be requested of the, of the utility, the rules allow the utility to notify the customer that their data has been subpoenaed and give the customer seven days to contest the subpoena in court. So um, that, that's the rules that we have in place to, to protect customer data in the case of a, of a, of a subpoena. Um, what I want to do just real fast, if I could, is go back to, to something that Chris talked about, about um, util how well the utility has been working on privacy. Um, when I first started working on privacy and got involved in NIST calls and NASB efforts, um, it was actually, and this was in 2011, a year and a half ago, it was very difficult to get utilities to want to talk about privacy at all. Um, when I would be on phone calls talking about what California just did, I'd get pushback from investor utilities and co-ops and public, public power to say, well, why do we want to do that? We don't want. We don't want to give another reason for our customers to call us. <laughs> that was one of that. That was literally one of the reasons said is that we don't want customers to start asking us questions because people on the phone on the um, for the CSR cost money, and we have better reasons to have our CSRs talk to customers than to answer privacy questions. Customer service reps. Yes, I'm sorry, customer service reps. And so that sort of that was mind-boggling to me because. As we move into smart grid and as we start developing and installing AMI, you know, customers should have access to their information. They're the ones paying for the meter to begin with. And yeah. you know, having a utility treat the customer as this um, as as if it's as if the utility is the lord over their fiefdom, um, and the and the customers are just little customers out there. You know, I think that those utilities are losing a a great opportunity to be more proactive. And they're missing a great PR opportunity to go out with their customers and explain this is to help the customer. This is not necessarily about the utility. We'll do. We're here to keep the lights on. That's what our job is to do. But we're here to also help you, customer, manage your, your load more effectively. And you know, privacy is a positive thing in my mind that the customer can look at the utility and say, "Okay, my utility is protecting my information." You know, that is a positive to the customer. So as a panel up here, we're talking about enterprise level, state level, uh, nation state, and international issues, a very high level. But we can't forget that every one of us in here lives in a house or an apartment, uh, mobile home, or even a car, I don't know. But if we're living in a house or an apartment, we all have direct relationship with this sort of thing. So we can't forget that. Normally when you have a panel like this, it's a little uncomfortable when people are on the phones or on their iPads, but if, if you promise not to, do for the rest of the session, I'd like everybody who's got a phone or an iPad or a computer available that's got browser capability, take it out for a two minute exercise. While you're looking it up, I'm going to give you a website to go to. So if you've got it, here's the website. Go to Gainesville, I didn't know this one already. <laughs> yeah, say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gainesville <laughs> dash green, that's Gainesville with an E. E -S 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 dash Gainesville. Gainesville, one word dash green.com and when you go there what you'll see yeah everybody that's going to do it we've already done it so uh, we're individuals so when you go to that website what you'll see in the upper right hand is a cute little map and what it represents is a hundred <coughs> households that's 100 households of 4, uh, 40,073 you have the wonderful opportunity to look at aggregated data on a house house by house basis. Let's pretend you live in Gainesville. Let's pretend one of those houses or pick the green one because green is good. 
Green is good, yellow is not as good, red is not as good as yellow. So pick one, doesn't matter, pick one. What you'll find when you pick that one is not only does it give you the street address, it gives you the year the house was built, it gives you the configuration of the house, and it gives you the kilowatt hours per month. But this gets better. Find the red one closest to your house and click on that. Chances are it's the same house, same year, same configuration, but probably they are using about two and a half times as much as you. <coughs> well, okay, so either they're growing pot or, or they just have really, really old um, uh, appliances, etc. So I did a very, very formal scientific um, census <coughs> yesterday, and we, we called it the uh, Starbucks um, Barista Coalition. <coughs> And what I did is I asked them this question. I said, do you mind if smart meters collect information, send it back to the utility, so it can be used for energy management and you can go online and manage your uh, power loads if you want? No, uh, not really. Yes, kind of, but nothing extreme. Then I said, okay, now look at this. Boom, I showed them that website. And dramatic, <coughs> dramatic differences in people's reaction. They did not like it. <coughs> Here's the kicker. What you're looking at is not uh, presented by or published by a utility. It's a third party software application firm that got that information aggregated from public information sources. That's today. That's today. So when you're looking at this, uh, and can I have about two more minutes? Is that right? Please, okay, take all right. two more minutes. So we've got, <laughs> we've got a couple. <laughs> Go ahead. Good? All right. Yeah. So a couple, of, all right. a, a couple of statements. I told you, the first two minutes are up, and after that, I'm going. So a couple of statements. Privacy is a cultural directive which is enabled through policies, procedures, technology, and appropriate security devices and measures. Privacy is a process, not a solution to be applied. So we have to remember that as policymakers and utilities and those that affect that. Second, privacy includes security 100%, but security can sidestep privacy. So that's why privacy, from my perspective, is, is paramount, and security supports that. Third, data collection and usage should be based on the need to know, and data retention should only be for as long as needed. Case in point. Back in 89, in the state of Washington, I owned a, a data services, well, it was called data services. It was a company that did, dealt with technology and servicing small business. 89 to 92, moved from Seattle down to Portland. This is the truth. Last week, I received a credit card application to data services to my home here in Portland, Oregon. 20 years later, and not only did they have the correct company name, the correct president of the company, they tracked me down in Portland, Oregon, which means that data was resident out there and somehow connected to, collected with, and aggregated, and then singled out for me 20 years later. So it was very timely relative to this panel, but very poignant because once the information is released, it's out there, just like the internet and photos. So I'm going to ask a question, hand it back this way. Can I do that? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so the, the, the question is, is relative to jurisdiction and informed consent. So informed consent is the consumer business residential goes, yeah, that's fine, boom, share the information. But the jurisdiction and the redress uh, capabilities of the consumer, once the information is gone, something goes wrong, how does the consumer get redress? And is this more from a third party marketing perspective or is this in addition to law enforcement? Well, no, 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 no. This is just from a, uh, when the utility takes the information and doesn't need to ask the consumer, for example, mm -hmm. that, that's fine. Okay. When the utility then dishes up the information, says to the consumer, what do you want to do with it? That's fine. When the consumer gives that approval off to an approved third party for primary purposes or even secondary, that's fine. Mm -hmm. After that, things can go wrong, information's out there. Now the consumer's got a problem. So my question this, this way is, hey, what is the consumer's redress over time after that happens? Well, I don't know what my other panelists would say, but I would say that really there is no redress, certainly not from a legal standpoint, no practical redress. 
The cost of litigating and the likelihood of um, recovering any type of redress is so low as to make it prohibitive, which is why privacy advocates spend so much time trying <coughs> to um, create other solutions uh, so that uh, a consumer isn't left having to basically seek redress in that situation. Um, you know, third party and kind of contractual legal frameworks, uh, one of the three sort of um, corners of the triangle of available legal frameworks to people, which would be constitutional legal frameworks, le legislative and regulatory legal frameworks, and then the third one being contractual, basically agreements entered into freely between the consumer and be it the utility or someone else regarding the use of their data. Um, while they are voluntarily entered into, in the world that we live in today, on a practical basis, it's very difficult to not voluntarily enter into third party agreements to let people use your data. The old shrink wrap, click through type of stuff. Exactly. It's like saying today, well, you can choose to have a telephone or you can choose not to have a telephone. So don't concern yourself about whether you know, AT&T and Verizon are turning over all of your uh, you know, metadata regarding your phone calls to the government on a regular basis. Just don't worry about it. If you know, it's your choice. You chose to have a telephone, so tough luck to you. Basically, you know, privacy advocates are saying, yeah, you know, it's equally infeasible that consumers are going to, you know, not enter into agreements with all sorts of third-party providers. So it's, there's not really that element of voluntarily voluntariness left. So I hope that answers the question. I don't think there really is an eerie address at that point. We need to stop it sooner. I have a question that dovetails on that. Have you seen any, I'm on the mic, have you, have you seen uh, any instances of the temptation, the monetary commercial temptation of a utility aggregating all this data and already having it and securing a database where it's gonna be treated properly and then someone from a third party says, hey, no one gets hurt. All you gotta do is just give us that database and we'll do the hard lifting, the heavy lifting, and the data mining, and we'll send some targeted marketing because we know that they like to open their fridge, their freezer actually, and eat ice cream at three in the morning. And, and theoretically, these, these signatures with the power spikes uh, and the timing, if, uh, like we said, with the right granularity of time interval and the specificity on the power uh, signatures, you could theoretically get those types of scenarios going. So if I was a marketing company and I had ability to process massive in types of information, have we seen people get approached and either deny or just kind of say, hey, no problem, we'll give this to you and if you pay us enough. It, is this already going on? Because it, it's hard for me to imagine that this is not already going on to some extent or it won't ever happen because the temptation for third party marketing folks to mine that level of rich data is just too much. And at some point, someone in the utilities will get that request if they're not already getting it. I mean, I don't know about any specific situation. Sounds like you're, you're sort of talking about, um, you know, utilities or people that legitimately have the information. Yeah, they already kind have of like the, they entering the into the financial agreement sort right. of on the slide. Like you said, Verizon, instead of selling it, instead of giving it to the government for subpoena stuff, they would sell it to a marketing company that wants to know where you are. Can I, can I try to address yeah. that? It's more on a commercial I'm gonna, threat than I'm a gonna surveillance ask, threat. Ask. Chris, to, to comment on what I'm going to say, you may not be able to, but I, mean, I think one of the one of the reasons why we were fairly successful in California with the sort of privacy framework uh, was precisely because it did, to some extent, discipline this relationship between utilities and third parties. And one of the reasons why the utilities, I think, were interested in it was because it, whenever you have an industry that is um, not a super high-tech industry to start with, and they see the Silicon Valley companies floating around them. What they're part of what they're worried about is, wait a minute, they want our data, or they want data that we might want to use later. And there's a certain sort of of push and pull here, right? Because yeah, maybe we would like somebody's help. On the other hand, we're really giving away the raw materials. Uh, at stake here, and uh, certainly in California, there were in the uh, PUC proceeding. We had an array of, you know, Google was present. Uh, the phone, the t big telcos and uh, broadband carriers were present. There was clearly this sense, to me at least, of uh, a lot of folks sort of chomping at at the data. Uh, the utilities, on the other hand, I felt at least in California, while they're very 
focused on, on the AMI stuff, they're not as high tech as these other guys. And indeed, the whole sort of, there's still a sense, I think, in which the, their culture is not quite moving, at, it's not as high tech as, as the Valley. So I think in, a, in an odd way, there was sort of a strategic value to the, uh, to the utilities to have these kinds of, uh, to set up these kinds of rules about how uh, data could be handled by, uh, by third parties. Uh, and, but I still, I agree with you though, that there is this strong incentive out there in the marketplace for the monetization of this extremely interesting data. I think the question is not if, the question is when and under what kinds of conditions. I mean, look, look at the Gainesville Green, and if you think of like a run keeper for power savings, like somebody builds an app to mine this data and then you can show off that you were so much more efficient than the Joneses next door, something like that. So it's like Foursquare for smart meters. Right, Foursquare for smart meters. Uh, <laughs> so there's got to be somebody in the, the, the VC sections are basically looking at solo, social, local, mobile. It will happen. And, yeah, and this is, this is coming up. it's not necessarily bad. It's not necessarily bad. Go ahead and comment, then I've got a comment on the comment. So um, <laughs> your, on your primary uh, question about, you know, are, is the utility going to sell the data? Well, mm -hmm. that's, that's prohibited under California state law. Utility One out of 56. The Cal Cal California utilities cannot sell customer data for a profit. Uh, customers can sign up and authorize whatever third party in the world they want to give the, give the, give the information to, and they do that. That's part of the uh, OPower Facebook model we're talking about right now, is that Facebook's seen up with OPower, there's a fun little thing on your Facebook page, and if you click through the whole process, you will eventually authorize OPower to give your data to Facebook. And then everyone on Facebook can see your power, your consumption. Or something like um, no, that's that's just one model. There's, there's plenty of other models. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, the, the Gainesville Green one is actually very interesting because I I was I heard about it a long time ago, and I always bring it up when I have these conversations because it's it's very interesting um, because what Gainesville Green does is they take information on Zillow, and Zillow is, is aggregating and taking information that's publicly available through you know city city halls that have all your you know, the land information and the house information. So it tells you when the house is built, the square footage, how many how, how many rooms, how many bathrooms are on there. It may even tell you what, what it sold for the last time. And a lot of people hate Zillow. Okay. And then because of a quirk in Florida law, which we haven't talked about here about Public Record Act. Right. Um, mm -hmm. because, of a, because of an Open Records Act law in Florida where municipal utility, if you take service from municipal utility and Gainesville's a municipal utility, there is no right to privacy because it's a public record. And so Gainesville Green is actually partnered with the Gainesville Utility, so it's not an independent third party, but they are partnering with Gainesville Utility, putting all that, the data together and putting it up on the Google map. So customers can opt out, but there's no opt in. And so, you know, this part of it was exactly as, as, as you put it, where this is a service that someone thinks is a good thing for customers. Make everyone aware of where your usage is, and you know, I'm, you no, know, my usage is better than the guy down the street, and rah, 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 aren't I so good? Um, that is a positive in some people's minds. Um, that's why we have privacy advocates up here saying, well, let's slow down here a little bit. Um, that may not actually be good for the privacy perspective. Okay. All right, so has anybody heard of the Prius effect? Yeah. Does anybody know what yeah. that is? Yeah. Ah, okay, beautiful. Yeah. All right, so if you had a, a Prius, then you happen to know that you have really full control of your energy management choices within that car. Nice display, tells you what you're doing when. You can accelerate hard or not. Uh, it's a wonderful example of how information can be consumer controlled, and it turns out that the consumers <coughs> do control the energy use. So this is the, the Prius effect. And the thought is, is the more information that you make available to consumers of their uh, electric usage, the more they will control it. There are some that never will, and some that can't. But the people who care will. So it, it, it's good. What I wanted to, to mention. Um, no, it's not on my mind. Oh, oh no, the, the, no, that's right. Okay, so the other half of the um, Starbucks uh, coalition, so to speak, was the, after showing them the, the website, and I said, well, wait a minute. Let's say you're one of the houses that's red, and you've got two and a half times the energy con uh, consumption, but 
you're a single income family, three kids, and you just can't afford to replace everything. Somebody uh, target markets you, sees that spike, because it's out there anyway, you could easily data mine it, and you go out there and say, you know what, I'm gonna send you $100 worth of coupons, plus uh, some tax incentives, I'm gonna allow you to replace your washer, your dryer, your furnace, your hot water tank. Now, two things happen here. One, you're incented to do it now, fantastic. Is that good or is that bad? Well, when I asked the, uh, the Starbucks strip, they said, well, you know, that's not so bad. So here they, they went from, ah, I don't want really to care about smart meters to going, oh my gosh, look at all this information, to all of a sudden there's a benefit, it's a carrot. So they were undecided, but the point was that it started to swing to be more positive. Now, the second side of that is more and more appliances are becoming smart appliances. So now it, it is actually a, um, uh, critical mass effect as you replace all these appliances. Now there is actually more availability of data going into the smart meter, going back to the utility to be made available to do for management, but also potentially to be released into the wild. And then once again, it propagates the whole privacy issue. I don't think we'll have time, but there are many, many, I just want to make this comment. Privacy just isn't, privacy issues doesn't just result, revolve around to release a personal information or the business information. It isn't just about release. There's many, many factors under the umbrella of privacy. And consumer education about that is critical. And we don't have time to talk about that, so it could take hours. We could have a three-day conference just about the legal uh, uh, culture of change issues. Can I ask a question? Yes, please, go ahead. Is, are any of the decisions about privacy, and I had a conversation with Chris before this, so I, I know he's an 